Wonderful fellowship. This time for us to go ahead and get going. Our first song before announcements will be song number 924. 924. We'll sing the first and last verse of this song. I am mine no more. I am mine no more. I am mine no more. I've been born. Welcome to the Church of Christ in Myrtle Beach. If you're visiting here with us today, and I know we have some folks here, maybe you're down here for the week or the weekend, and you decided to come and worship with us this morning, you're an inspiration to us. We're so happy to see you. I hope that you'll come back and join us next time you're in this area. And for all those who are here streaming uh, with us in, in, in spirit, streaming, welcome to you, and we also look forward to the day that you can come and be a part of this service with us in person as well. We do have a nursery. If you need to make use of it, just step outside and we'll take you to it. It's right over here. You can see through this window. There's a speaker so you can hear, and we serve communion in there. Our prayer list for today, and most of the details on these folks on our prayer list are in the bulletin, but Denny Kaufman and Wilton Davis, Jeff Fitcher and Frankie Highsmith, Sammy and Hazel Green, David and Linda Colina, Jack Little, Gianna Moss, Dean Rogers, Sue Royals, Joy Summers, Wanda Williams, and Sandy Woodfin. Sympathy is also extended to Frankie and Denise on the death of their brother, 
John Dwayne Tharp. Our Vacation Bible School begins this Wednesday, August 3rd through the 7th, and that is for classes for ages 2 through adult. We will have adult classes for this as well. There's more information in the bulletin about that and as well as on the bulletin board. And this Wednesday, we're going to kick it all off with a wiener roast, and that's going to be from 5.30 until 6.30. And if you can help, you can see Roger Richardson or Clay Rail, and you can sign up on the bulletin board. When I first heard about this, the first thing that came to my mind is Linda Myers has moved back to West Virginia, and I wish she was here. So attention, everybody here from West Virginia. We know that you have a way with hot dogs. We're looking for chili. We're looking for slaw. We're your special touch, but also everything else, mustard and ketchup and all that. And um, there is our new 40-year-old who I, I didn't know if Clay was teasing us or her or not, but apparently she is 40. Happy birthday, Michelle. Does not look 40. Back to the weenie roast. Because of that and our cookout on Saturday, uh, the fellowship meal has been canceled. But very important that we notice that Wednesday we are indeed inviting the community. So we're looking for some volunteers to welcome uh, guests from the community. We're going to have signs out here. We're just going to ask everybody to come on in. Russell says that Joey Chestnut's coming. So we could use, I don't have to tell you which Russell said that. But we would love for you to, to come and be a part of that as a volunteer. If you can't make the food or anything like that, let's have a good turnout for that on Wednesday night. Good old-fashioned summertime weenie roast. Uh, there will be no monthly fellowship meal next Sunday because of the two meals this week. But tonight will be our Sunday, fifth Sunday singing night, if you want to come and join us for that. We're also collecting items for the Pack-A-Sack program. And that is a program to collect needed items for foster youth while they are away at college. Items can include school supplies, snacks, hygiene products, gift cards, Bibles, or other items. And there is a suggested list posted in the hallway. And if you have any questions about that, you can see Megan Parks. And the items that uh, we are asking for, we'd like to get those here by Sunday, August 7th, which is next Sunday. So uh, put them in the fellowship hall. All you have to do is put them there. We'll figure it out from there. Are there any other announcements? At this time... The elders would ask that you would turn off any electronic devices that may interfere with our time of worship. And let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the day. Lord, we're so grateful for this time of worship, learning, and praise. And as we prepare for it, we ask that you clear our minds of all worldly thoughts so we can truly focus on hearing your word. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, our next song is song number 743. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verse of this song. Mm -hmm. Oh, land of rest for thee, I sigh when will the moments come when I shall lay my armor by and dwell in peace at home will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes will work till Jesus comes and will be gathered home no tranquil joys on earth i know no peaceful sheltering dome this world's a wilderness of woe this world is not my home will work till jesus comes will work till jesus comes will work till jesus comes and will be gathered home I sought at once my Savior's side, no more 
my steps shall roam. With him I'll brave death's chilling tide and reach my heavenly home. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work till Jesus comes and will be gathered home. Our next song before our opening prayer and scripture reading will be song number 134. Faith is the victory. If you're following along at home or in, the, in your song book, the invitation song, if you want to go ahead and mark that now, will be song number 756 when we all get to heaven. That is the invitation song. The faith is a victory. One thirty-four. Please let's let us stand for this song. Encamped along the hills of light, ye Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the foe in vales below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. His banner over us, His love, our sword, the Word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they, like a whirlwind's breath, swept on over every field. The faith by which they conquered death is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. On every hand the foe we find, drawn up in dread array, let tents of ease be left behind, and onward to the train. Salvation, faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. To him who overcomes the foe, right raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know, his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame. will vanquish all the host of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Please be seated. Good morning, church. Please pray with me. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day and for all the beautiful people here today. We pray for all of us here, all on our prayer list, everyone joining us online, and all our visitors, including our Christian sister Gail from the Rome, New York Church of Christ. We are blessed to have you all here with us today. Father, as we are going through some difficult times, Please help us to remember that you will get us past them, past them, along with the prayers and support of our church family. We also need to understand 
that no matter how bad the perception of our problems and supposed suffering may be, it pales in comparison to the pain and suffering that your Son endured to destroy the repercussions of our sins and to give all humans who will ever live the opportunity for eternal life with you and your Son. Father, we pray for the strength and faith to remain positive through our family hardships and stress. We also need to keep our tempers in check if, if and when our patience is tested. We pray, pray that we will listen and learn from your word as presented this morning by our brother Stephen, and that we gain the strength to survive the worldly strain until we come together again in your house. We pray this through your son, Jesus. Amen, and God bless America. There are going to be two scriptures for today's scripture reading. The first is going to be from the book of Isaiah. That is going to be chapter 38, verse 1. If you're following along in the Red Pew Bible, it's going to be page 637. 637. And it reads, In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. The second verse is going to be from the book of Acts. And that's going to be verse or chapter 21, verse 13. Now it's going to be page 989 in the Red Pew Bible. Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of Lord Jesus. Good morning, church family, and good morning to all of our guests. You're our honored guest today. We're so glad to have you with us. We're involved in a year-long sermon series we call Do, the Church in You in 2022, and all of our lessons are based upon the church. The church is not a building. The church is people, people that have been called out. The Greek word for church in your Bible is ekklesia, means the called out one. We're the called out people. The book of Acts, which we're working through now, is the book about the actions of these people, these New Testament Christians. And Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 really is the agenda for the entire book. We are to be kingdom people who take the word of God, and that day they started in Jerusalem, the first seven chapters, in Judea. And then Samaria, 8 through 12, and finally, to uttermost parts of the earth, 13 to 28. We're now in the third part of that section, as Paul is the main character, taking the gospel to the world. And as I was studying our text today, by the way, you want to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 19. We left off last week at verse 10. But as we were working through Acts 19 and 20 and 21, as I was reading that section, I really thought about this, the first scripture read for our hearing a moment ago. Here, King Hezekiah was facing death. And God said to him, set your house in order. Now that phrase has gone through the ages, and we still use it today. If somebody is told they have six months to live, we said you need to get your house in order. Get things right, settled, ready. Well, as I was reading those three chapters in Acts 19... 20 and 21, that's exactly what Paul was doing. Paul was setting his house and those that he ministered to, their house, in order. Paul lived his life as if every day was his last. You say, that's kind of morbid. Oh, no. But if I ask you this question, if you knew you had only a short time to live, would that bring you fear or bring you faith? We're going to find out today is that if you're ready, when you hear you're going to die, you're full of faith. But if you're not ready, you're full of fear. The Apostle Paul had overcome his fear of death by his faith in Christ. He didn't have a death wish. He had a life wish to live for Christ. So in Philippians 1 and verse 21, for me to live is Christ, but to die 
is gain. I've told my congregation many times this, but Paul had the philosophy. Leave me alone, I'll preach Jesus. Put me in jail, I'll write about Jesus. Kill me, I'll be with Jesus. Now, how do you beat a guy like that? He's Jesus-centered. And so he had the power. So he could look death right in the eye and say in 1 Corinthians 15, 55 to 58, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin. Strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who's given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? So we are people that have already died. Do you realize that? The church is. Because the Bible tells us, and it happened to Paul, Paul was Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church. But when he was converted in Acts 9, and Acts 22, 16 records it, he was baptized, and the old man Saul was left in the baptistry. And the new man Paul was raised to walk in a newness of life. A life that he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, begins every day with, I die daily. I die to the old Saul. You die to live to be with Christ. So Paul said in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But it's not me living. It's Christ living in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So this morning, we're going to look at what is the secret of setting your house in order. How can I know today? How can I get ready for that day? We're going to begin, first of all, by looking at chapter 19, beginning at verse 11, where, first of all, we realize that if we're going to set our house in order, we have to be faithful in doctrine, the name of Christ, his authority in my life. It's the doctrine versus the devil. In chapter 19 and verse 11, he tells us, the writer does, Luke, and I'll back up a moment before I get to that verse. Remember, we talked about when Jesus came to the earth last year and talking about how he came in the Gospels. Because he was on the earth, there was never more good than then. I mean, God was walking on the earth. So God allowed Satan to be more powerful than usual during those days, just so God could demonstrate his power was greater than Satan's. And one of those areas was demon possession. So when Jesus cast out demons, it showed that he was more powerful. On one occasion, even his enemy says, you get your power from the devil. He says, the devil wouldn't cast out the devil. That doesn't make any sense. But he was showing the power of God. Well, he gave that power also to the apostles. And now in chapter 19 and verse 11, it says that there was an ordinarily extraordinary time of miraculous things through Paul's ministry, to the point that even his sweatband, you wear that in the summertime, or your aprons, as he's working on tents, they could be sent, those materials could be sent to somebody, and they all do is touch them, and they'd be healed, just like he was there in person, or demon exercised. That's extraordinary. There's also extraordinary evil going on at the same time. There were seven sons of Sceva. These seven sons were trying to imitate what Paul was doing. And they were fakes. But they would go around saying, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, come out of them. Well, first of all, they're admitting they don't even know Jesus, the one that Paul preaches. But it's interesting what the demon said out of that individual. He says, Jesus, I know. You know, the Bible tells us in James 1, 2 and verse 19, that even the devils believe in the Lord. Now we saw in the Gospels that many a time when Christ was going to do an exorcism, they said, Son of God! They knew who Jesus was. They even believed he was Son of God. James said they even trembled at the idea of his power. But they are not going to change. Jesus, I know, demon says. Get this. Paul, I know. You ever thought about that? Not only does God know you, the devil knows you. One time Jesus stopped Peter and said, Peter, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. This is Peter. 
another occasion, Satan is prancing around heaven telling God, I got the whole world in my pocket. And God said, not quite. Have you considered my servant Job? Oh, he knew Job. Oh, yeah, because you spoiled him. Take away his toys, take away his health, he'll curse you to your face. Which he didn't. Satan's not very smart. Clever, but not smart. But here we see a marvelous example of Satan knows us. Does he know us as one like Paul that's not going to bow down to him? But then the Spirit says, but who are you, these seven sons? Who are you? Even Satan has no respect for fakes. So the Spirit comes out of the man and gets into the seven men. They run away naked and wounded. Now, when the people saw that, they were really into this exorcisms and all this uh, magic and all these soothsaying things. When they saw that, they brought all of their scrolls, all of their books, all of their trinkets, and they burned them right there. And well, I'm not sure why, but Luke wants us to know that was quite an investment in getting rid of evil. 50 shekels, 50,000 shekels of silver. That's like 50 uh, shekels like a day's wage. It's a lot of people's day's wage for a long time. They're trying to get that out of their lives. I've forgotten the movie's name now, but a few years ago I saw a movie where a young man was into pornography. He was trying to get out of it. And finally he realized he just couldn't do it. So he, he pulled the computer, this is the old days, pulled the computer out of the wall and he threw it away. Now you say, it's not the computer's fault. But to him, that tool was his stumbling block. To these people, those tools would be a stumbling block. So what he's telling us today is, if you've got something as your stumbling block, burn it. Get rid of it. Get out of your life. Look at the power of God here now in doing that. Another example is, there was these people that were losing money because Paul was preaching there's only one God and he's the Spirit. And they were building these statues, making these idol gods for folks. They were losing business. So he decided to, to get Paul and put him into a situation where he would be killed. But they couldn't find Paul. They took two other Christians with them. They got to this theater, and the people were just trying to convince themselves that they were right and he was wrong. They began to cry out, Diana, King James Version, or, or Artemis, and other versions, Goddess of the Ephesians, goddess of the Ephesians, trying to get them to realize in their minds that she was right and Paul was wrong. To God's credit, a cool head won the day. The one who was over the whole situation, that, that temple area, he said, wait a minute, guys. He says, you're all ready to kill this man, but he hasn't done anything. These people here have not done anything that's against the law. So if we try to do something like that, we'll be against the law. So you need to go out and chill out. That's my translation. Go chill out. And they did. Again, that shows you the power of God. Extraordinary good, extraordinary evil, but extraordinary response. Now, if you're open to Acts chapter 19, look at verse 20 with me. 19 and verse 20. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. The Bible tells us in John 17, 17, thy word is truth. The Bible tells us and we follow his word, we follow him. Paul says, follow me as I follow the Christ. And when you follow him, you've got a power like the world does not understand. And you're doing it in his name. Colossians 3.17, and whatever you do, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Do all in his name, the name of the Lord. That's the power. The power is in being faithful in his doctrine. But second of all, is being faithful in his worship. We have a lot of visitors today, this might sound familiar to you, but Paul was traveling. And as he was traveling, now chapter 20, get down to about verse 6, you'll find that he lands at Troas. Now Paul is in a hurry. You all have been in a hurry when you're on a vacation? Does it seem like everybody's in a hurry right now in Myrtle Beach? 
you get in a hurry, right, when you're on vacation because you want to see this and do that. you got plans. you got to get there and get there. Okay? That's Paul. If you read this very carefully. In fact, the 21st chapter it sounds just like that. I mean, he's going here, 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 next day, next day. He's got an agenda. He wants to get down to Jerusalem before a major feast so he can give the collection he's got from the Gentiles to them. That would be the easiest place to distribute it when they're all in town. Look with me here at uh, verses 21 and 22. So after these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit when he had passed through Macedonia and Achaia, he was going to go through those areas on purpose on his way to Jerusalem. Did you know that new church plants need nurturing? Paul said, I planted Apollos water, God gave the increase. Well, Paul did his watering too. He's going to go through there and try to get these new church plants going. But his final mission was to get down to Jerusalem. And that wasn't the final mission. He wanted to get there so he could go to Rome. Okay? The Apostle Paul had in his mind that when I get to Rome, he's going to walk in there as a conquering preacher. He would go there as captured in chains. But he'll go there bound for the Christ. We don't know what the future holds. We know who holds the future. And so verse 22 ends by saying, but he stayed in Ephesus a little bit longer. We know why. Keep your marker here and go to 2 Corinthians, uh, yes, 2, 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And we're going to verses 8 and 9. 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9. He writes the Corinthian letter while he's in Ephesus. And he makes this statement. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great door of effectual is open unto me. In other words, i got a real open door of opportunity to evangelize. But he doesn't stop there. And there are many adversaries. It's not going to be easy. I like Matlock. I like Andy Griffith. I also like Matlock. Same guy. But in Matlock, he has a, a saying. He says all the time, says, nothing's easy. Folks, in Christ, nothing's easy. And so as this man has this plan to do this now, Paul does. I'm going to go there. But again, back to chapter 20, verse 6, he waits seven days. He's in a hurry. He waits seven days just so he can meet with the brethren at Troas on the Lord's day. How important it is to be together on the Lord's day. Look at this verse with me. We're in Acts 20 now in verse 7. And upon the first day of the week. Now you know Paul was a Jew and the Jews, their day of worship was Saturday, Sabbath. But when Jesus raised from the dead early that Sunday morning, that was now resurrection day. It was a day in which the Lord's people gathered together upon the first day of the week, Sunday. In fact, the Bible tells us 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, as is the custom of you to get together on the first day of the week when you come together, also get this gathering together, Paul's collecting, for the saints. It was the day they went, as it says here, upon the first day of the week for the express purpose to break bread. Not a common meal. The way it's used also in Acts 2 and verse 42, when it says to the church that first began there, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and in prayer, the Lord's Supper. Now they also broke bread when they ate together in their homes, chapter 2, verse 46. This is not talking about that at this time. It's talking about the Lord's Supper. How do we know that? Well, one of them, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth again, and he's chiding them. In fact, the book of 1 Corinthians is all about church problems. And he's chiding them that they're not doing right in their Lord's Supper. And he says, when you come together, it's not to break bread. It's not to take the Lord's Supper. But it is. But they weren't doing it right. But that's the reason, folks. We come together to break bread, the Lord's Supper. And there's nothing like taking the Lord's Supper in person. Amen? That's what it was designed for. Upon the first day of the week, there was a specific day, the Lord's day, the first day of the week. The disciples came together. The Lord's people.
do that. The Lord's people, disciples, says back in Acts chapter 11, they were called Christians first at Antioch. So the Christians come together, bringing their friends and neighbors, but they're coming together, the Christians, for the express purpose of the Lord's Supper, the fruit of the vine, the unleavened bread, to remember the Lord's death until he comes. It is a memorial. When we come together to memorialize the Lord, we're remembering that. It's re Juvenating us, it's recharging our spiritual batteries. It's getting our mind back where it should be on the Lord. Paul says, I determine not to know anything. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. God's people suffered. But also there was a message here. You ever heard people say, do we have to go on Sunday night to church? <laughs> well, would you believe this gathering was on Sunday night? They work all day Sunday, but after 6, when the Jews began a new day, Sunday, they came together, and Paul preached until midnight. You say, brother, I hope you're not following that example today. But he preached until midnight because he was setting the house in order. He's going to tell us a few moments. He was convinced he would never see them again. Because, again, every day was the last day for him. So he had to get it all in. And as he's preaching to them, this is an upper room. Someone's probably one of the members' homes. And they use candles for light, so it's kind of stuffy. Long day, long sermon. Okay? I came across a little slide record for the sermon, and it says, the dangers of falling asleep in church. But anyway, it's a long day, and this young man was getting real sleepy, but he wanted to hear the sermon. So he got over to the window, the only ventilation they had there, trying to stay awake as he was nodding. And guys, kids, he fell asleep. Then he fell out of the window. Then he fell down to the ground. Then he fell dead. You talk about ending a worship service. No, it's just the beginning. Because he went down there, Paul did, and raised that boy back to life again. What a symbolic, wonderful concept. This is Resurrection Day. And that church will never forget that scene. Nor can we forget Jesus raised from the dead. You will remember the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's Supper. And the power of his word. And then faithful in service. Beginning at verse 13. Here we go now. He's really going from place to place to place. Next place. He's in a hurry. He's such in a hurry. He gets down to verse 17. And he wants to talk to the Ephesian elders at Ephesus. But he hasn't got time. So he, he gets the word to them, meet me here at Miletus. And when they come to meet him, this is what Paul has to say to them. And when they were come to him, he said to them, verse 18, You know that from the first day that I came into Asia, at what manner I have been with you at all seasons. This really is a powerful verse to me. The Apostle Paul didn't remind the elders. When I was with you, remember the power of my preaching. doesn't say that. Remember the power of my miracles. doesn't say that. Remember the power on how I lived before you. My manner of life. People don't care how much you know. They know how much you care. I'd rather... See a sermon any day is to hear one. You know how I lived before you. Okay? He's got a reason for saying that. I'll show you in a few minutes why you're saying this. But you know how I lived before you. Okay? And then in verse 19, he talks about his mindset. Okay? His motive for doing this. He says, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. It wasn't a job for him. It was a ministry. So much so that he reminds us here in verse 33 to 35. He said, I coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel when I was with you ministering. In fact, I worked my own hands to support myself. It's more blessed to give than to receive. He was a minister, a servant. And he said, in all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befall me, while a lion in the weight of the Jews. I'm going to 
earlier we read from that First Corinthian letter, he says, and many adversaries. It was tough going, guys, what he was doing. Many tears and trials. Tempted and tried, I've oft made to wonder. Father Long will understand why. Well, you can understand it right now if you have your house in order. But look at verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, that have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. I'm going to preach to you the whole counsel of God. Look at verse 27. For I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. That's my motive. To preach to you from kiver to kiver, as one Scottish man said about the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation. And then he says here in verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God. Now, now he's talking to people now who are idolaters. To turn away from your worldliness and turn to godliness. Faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so in the past, Paul was a busy man, but he was busy in the Lord's work. A lot of people say, I'm too busy to do the Lord's work. He was busy in the Lord's work. But in the present, he was pressed to keep on going, even though it was tough times ahead for him. Look here at verse 22, 23. And now behold, I go bound, he says, in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall before me there, except save that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. The word's out. If you're going to go to Jerusalem, you're going to be treated terribly. Here's an example for us. Look at Acts 21 and look at verse 10. There's one prophet named Agabus. He comes to visit Paul on his way to Jerusalem. He says, Paul, I want to borrow your belt for a minute. He takes off his belt, gives it to him. And Agabus ties Paul's belt around his hands and his feet. And he says, whoever owns this belt can be treated this way and be given over to the Gentiles, the Romans, Roman people, Jewish people. If you were against it. Would you want to go any further? Look at the next verse it says for us here, verse 12. And when we heard these things, both we, notice we there, Luke, who wrote this book, has now rejoined the Apostle Paul, and he joins in trying to convince Paul, don't go. He loves Paul. We and they of that place, everybody else there, begged him not to go to Jerusalem. We love you, Paul. Don't go and die. Then Paul answered, what mean you to weep and break my heart? Why are you trying to break my heart? I am ready. The secret of getting your house in order is being ready. I am ready not to be bound only, but to die for the name of the Lord Jesus. Let me tell you something. If you ever could find bunch of Christians like this, you could find a church like this, you could turn the world upside down. Not afraid to die. I've already died. I live for Christ. That's what Paul says. And the church said, wow. <laughs> wow. Well, it's also faithful in leadership. Remember what Paul is saying here. He's saying to the Ephesian elders, back in verse 17, this is his speech to them. And it says elders. There is a position in the church that God designed. Leaders in the church, they're called elders for a reason. The word elder means older. It comes from the word presbytery. It means older, mature. I tell folks, I'm not this old. I got the gray hair because there have been a lot of elders meeting. But it means older, okay? Older. Also, it means elder, but also it means overseer. Look here at verse 27. And um, I'm in chapter 20, and verse, excuse me, yes, chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock 
which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers. You see that? The elders are older. That's who they are. They've been around the block and have the scriptural qualifications found in 1 Timothy 3, Titus 1, 1 Peter 5. Okay? They're older, but also they're to be overseers. This is what they do. They oversee. The word in the Greek is episkopos. It, epi means over, and scope means to see. We know that because we have something. We have something we want to see way out far. What do we call that? A telescope. If I want to see something really close and up close, I get a microscope. Elders are those who are told to look long into the future, plans for the church, stay on the right track, but also a microscope and every little jot and tittle also in control. Here we go. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, Paul says. See, Paul had already done that. That's why he began by talking about himself. He says, you know how I live before you. You know how I, my ministry was before you. My mindset was all in all humility. You know the message I gave to you was the word of God. So he's taken heed to himself, Paul. Now he says, you elders do the same kind of fact-checking. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Test yourself, whether you're in the faith. Take heed to yourselves first, and then to the flock. Because see, not only are we called elders, and we're called overseers, who we are and what we do, but we're also called shepherds. That's how we do it. If you read Psalm 23, you know the most tender relationship on the earth almost is a shepherd and his sheep, 24-7, 365. It even says in John chapter 10, that the shepherd knows his sheep, the sheep know their shepherd. He calls them by name, the sheep, and they follow him. Relationship, shepherding, that's how we do it. Take heed, therefore, to yourselves with a flock, which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church. You've got to feed sheep. And if you don't feed sheep, it's bad. So how do you feed sheep? You make sure in the church they get the Word of God. If you don't have the Word of God preached in your church, that's bad. You got it? That's bad. It's good if you had the Word of God. In your classes, in your sermons, in your Bible studies, you have the Word of God. Okay, Feed them with the Word of God. Feed your church. And then he says, not only feed them, but meet their needs. You meet the needs of the sheep. It says in Psalm 23 at night, he pours that oil over their heads to soothe them, take care of all their problems. Meet their needs. And then also, weed Look at verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. When you have a wonderful congregation of sheep like we have here, you always got to be careful that a sheep in, or a wolf in sheep's clothing can come in and try to pull away. That's what he says here, verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, draw away disciples after themselves, calling the church flip. Therefore, watch. 24-7, watch the sheep. You can't turn your back. You parents know that you can't turn your back on your child in a grocery store, can you? You can't turn your back on the sheep, ever. You've got to watch and remember. Remember those who have gone before you, those great leaders who kept the sheep going and growing. That by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you day and night with tears. It's, it's something you've got to keep on, got to keep on, you've got to keep on. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. I give you to God, the chief shepherd. Christ. Look back at verse 24 for a minute.
This is one verse that gets all, puts it all together of getting your house in order. But none of these things move me. Talking about this idea of him going to Jerusalem and being persecuted and dying. But none of these things move me, neither count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. And the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that of you all, among whom I have now gone preaching the kingdom of God, the church, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day, I am pure from the blood of all men. How can you say that? For I have not shunned to preach and declare unto you the whole counsel of God. And they knew that. So look here now at verse 36. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and he prayed with them all. The power of prayer. And they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him. They loved him. Sorry, most of all, for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And he accompanied him under the ship. How could they let him go? Now go back to 21, chapter 21. And verse 13, when Paul says, I'm ready, verse 14 says, and when he would not be persuaded, to, to not go. We, Luke and the rest, stopped saying the will of the Lord be done. When you got your house in order, you know where you came from, what you're doing here, and where you're going. And nothing can stop you. In Romans chapter 8, in that powerful way he ends chapter 8 there, he says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Neither death, nor life, nor principalities, nor powers, things present, nor things to come, the height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ. Wow. So today, I just ask you this question. Are you ready to die? Brother God, we live for that every day. We're not morbid. We're ready. Are you ready? If somebody wants to take you on a trip today, they would ask you, are you ready? Well, i got to go pack. When we, every day, get up in the morning, what can I do for you, Lord, today? How can you use me today, Lord? And let him do that in your life. And you're packing your bags. So that when he comes, in fact, John ends this Bible by saying, Lord, come quickly. I'm ready. No, it's not morbid. It's Christianity. And when people meet you, they're going to say, there's something really different about you. You're living the cruciform life. I've died, and Christ liveth in me. If you've not been baptized into Christ, you see what you're missing. You can die to your old sins. And that watery grave and be raised to walk in a newness of life, a child of God. Born again of water and spirit. And your name is changed to Christian. And then as you try to live that life, if you've fallen away and you're not ready, the Lord came today, you're not packed. You're packed with a lot of sin, but not with, with God's saints. Then you need to come forward this morning. We'll pray with you and for you. The most important thing in this world is being ready. Will you come? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace in the mansion, right and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing has to be.
Psalm number 621, 621, 10,000 angels. Now, there are four verses. We're going to do something a little different. There are four verses to this psalm, and there are four set of pews here. So if y'all would, this set of pews will sing the first verse. Y'all will sing the second verse. Y'all will sing the third verse. And y'all will sing the fourth verse. And then we will all come in together at the end to sing the chorus. First, second, third, fourth verse, all at the end, come and sing the chorus. 10,000 angels. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They sat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he to blame upon his precious head they placed a crown of thorns they laughed and said behold the king they struck him and they First him and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered and breathing. When they nailed him to the cross, his mother stood nearby. He said, Woman, behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water, but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone, and when he cried, it's finished, he gave it to die salvation's 
wondrous plan was done. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. Good morning. We have reached the time in our service this morning to partake of the Lord's Supper. This is a time to remember and celebrate our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's a time to reflect on the sacrifice that was made for each and every one of us so that we may have an opportunity to hear the word, believe the word, share the word, and be baptized into his death for a chance at eternal life. It's also important to remember, as we talked briefly about this morning, that this is not a suggestion but a command. I'll now read from Matthew 26. Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. This time he also took a cup, and we had given thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Luke 22 also states to do this in remembrance of me. Scripture also indicates the importance of this time and that it's required for us to self-examine ourselves before taking of the cup. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 26 through 29, For as often as you eat this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself, then and so eat the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is Paul, as Stephen talked about earlier today, reminding us that this is a, a memorial of Christ's sacrifice. Let us now remember what was done and the opportunity that it provides for each and every one of us. If you would, please pray with me for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father and Almighty God, as we get ready to partake of this bread, Allow us to remember that it represents the body of Christ and the sacrifice that was made so that each and every one of us may have a chance at eternal life with you in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We now have an opportunity to take the cup. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father and Almighty God, as we get ready to take the cup, please allow us to remember that it represents the blood that was shed. And as Clay led in his song, he could have called 10,000 angels to stop the pain, the suffering, the ridicule that he went through. But instead, he chose to fulfill the plan so that each and every one of us may have a chance at eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper, but now we have an opportunity to give back. Many of us have much more than we need, probably deserve, and the scripture states, God loves a joyful giver. If you would, please pray with me for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father and Almighty God, let us take this opportunity to, opportunity to open up our hearts and give back. You have given us all so much, and we need to, to offer back to you so that we have a chance to, to grow our church, spread your word, and continue to to spread your name across all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. 
Well, we uh, really appreciate everybody coming out this morning to worship here at the Myrtle Beach Church of Christ. Everyone here and also online who's attended. Um, we have a special time of prayer tonight, prayer service at 530 and also evening worship here at 6 o'clock. So please, please come back uh, tonight to hear another wonderful lesson. Our song, our last song is uh, Sing Hallelujah to the Lord. It's to me, it's one of the most beautiful songs in our songbook, and it's upon everything which we stand. The first verse is sing hallelujah to the Lord. The second is Jesus is risen from the dead. The third one is Jesus is living in our church. Fourth is Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Fifth, he is coming back to claim his own. And six, that is why we sing hallelujah to the Lord. Upon all these things, we stand and ask you to stand for this song. And please, sing out. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Lord, sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is living. Jesus is living. Jesus is living in his church. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back to claim his own. He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back to claim his own. So sing hallelujah to the Lord. Sing hallelujah to the Lord. Oh, Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to the Lord, to the Lord. Amen. Before our closing prayer, I have an announcement to make. Anyone homeschooling or interested in homeschooling, there will be a short meeting right after the service in the annex. If you are unable to attend this meeting, please feel free to contact Coco Hardwick or Michelle Rell. But dearly, Father, we thank you for the love that you have for us. We also thank you for the plan that you have for us. We pray that through our service and our glorification to you today that we came closer uh, to being part of that plan. We ask you that you forgive us of all our sins and be with us as we depart from this place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.